Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to get started. Um, thanks for joining us today. My name is Leah Pope, and I'm the acting director of the Substance Use and Mental Health Program here at Vera. Um, so, Dr. Jennifer Johnson is joining us today for the final Neil Wiener Research Speaker Series of the year. Um, if you don't know, this speaker series invites distinguished scholars and researchers to share their work on justice issues. And the series began under the leadership of the late Neil Wiener, who was a former research fellow and research director at Vera. And after his passing, the series was named in his honor. So I am really excited that Dr. Johnson is joining us today. Um, Dr. Johnson is a clinical psychologist, and she is the C.S. Mott Endowed Professor of Public Health at Michigan State University. Um, she conducts uh, National Institute of Health-funded research on the effectiveness, cost-effectiveness, and implementation of mental health and substance use interventions for justice-involved populations. This includes a randomized controlled trial that she recently did for people with depression who are incarcerated. And she's been the principal investigator on nine NIH-funded studies, which, as a researcher, is really impressive. <laughs> Um, Dr. Johnson came to Michigan State from Brown in January 2015 to help build an academically vibrant and socially responsive team of community-engaged scholars based in Flint, Michigan, um, and she's the first member of Michigan State University's new public health research collective. And she's also working on an effort to create the Michigan Mental Health and Justice Center that Vera hopes to support as a consortium partner in the future. So, um, just as to wrap up, you know, I get asked all the time, what works? How do we improve um, services for people with mental illness um, in jails and prisons? That's a question I get asked almost weekly. Um, so I'm really excited to hear from someone who may have some answers for us. So thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I've heard about the work you've done for a long time. I'm friends with and love Aisha, and so I'm just happy to be here and talk to all of you. And your posters on the wall with justice slogans make me really happy. Um, so this is no surprise to you, you know, about all the people who are involved in the justice system. Um, what I like to tell people who haven't worked a lot in the system is it's nothing like the TVs and movies. Um, you know, a lot of facilities are minimum and medium security facilities. If you go in late at night to the women's facility, they have pink towels around their hair. They're playing Scrabble. Um, it's not mostly rapists and murderers who are locked away for life. It's mostly people who are in and out pretty quickly. Um, and this, and I like to show this slide to people. And, you know, when you get to a certain age, when I started working there, the women who I worked with looked like me, and now they look like my daughters. But regardless, you know, they're young and you know, they look like people we all know and love. So, you know, what does the justice system have to do with public health? Well, it turns out that this is a system that's a high locus uh, location for the fight against a lot of public health issues. Um, a good chunk of folks with HIV go through this system every year. Um, the three largest mental health treatment providers in the country are jails. About 20% of people with substance use disorders are justice involved. And most are back in the community quickly, you know, picked up, held in pretrial jail detention and back within a few days. And even people who are charged, you know, many, most are back within a year or two. So if I could help everybody in the world understand one thing, it would be this, that detainee health is public health. The folks are in and out of the community quickly. You can't separate, you know, health in the justice system from health in the community and that public health is different from public safety. So, you know, the public safety mandate of the justice system is to keep the public safe, um, bring people who commit crimes to justice and prevent crime, and obviously public health is improving health. And the justice system has mandates to do both, actually legally mandates to do both. And it's really interesting because when I submit to the National Institutes of Health, it's supposed to be about health, and yet I've still had grant reviewers come back and say that if I looked more at recidivism data, it would increase the public health significance. And I'm not saying that recidivism isn't important, it is, but it's not health. And so it's both, and it also gets conflated, which we'll talk about in a minute, in a lot of the literature. A lot of the mental health treatment studies only look at justice outcomes, they don't look at mental health outcomes. Um, so people kind of get these things tangled together in their heads a little bit, and it's, I think it's important to disentangle them and think about both. So um, 
Let me tell you about one study first. Let's talk a little bit about suicide in the U.S. Um, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S., and I believe it's second for young folks, for folks, I think, between 18 and 40. Um, about 43,000 Americans die by suicide every year. And um, so because of this, it's really interesting. The National Institute of Mental Health and others are working on a zero suicide initiative to try to get um, suicide in the United States down to zero. And while they were looking at where folks at risk are, about half of people um, who commit suicide in any year aren't in any kind of mental health treatment. So they thought about, okay, where are they? And when they were trying to figure out where they are, one of those places is the justice system. Um, as a matter of fact, this is a two principal investigator study, me and Lauren Weinstock from Brown University. Lauren went through the National Violent Death Registry and found that 10% of suicides with known causes occur in the context of a recent criminal or legal stressor. So, you know, that's 10% of these folks have had some kind of recent justice involvement or justice influence on their lives. Um, so we thought, well, okay, um, it turns out that there are interventions that are used in emergency departments for folks at risk by suicide that can reduce suicide by 50 to 90% in the year after that emergency department visit. We thought pre-trial jail detention isn't so different from an emergency department visit in that you tend to get folks at high risk for a lot of things. Um, and so you can do sort of screening, linkage, and referral interventions there. So what we proposed to do was to evaluate uh, the safety planning intervention, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a minute, um, during pre-trial jail detention as a way to reduce suicide in the year after jail release. And if it's as effective in emergency departments as it is, I mean, as effective in the jail as it is in emergency departments, implementing it in all the jails could reduce all U.S. suicides by 5 to 9 percent. So this is a partnered um, study between Michigan State and Brown University. We have jails um, in Flint and a community mental health system in Flint, where I am, and the jail and a community mental health system in Rhode Island. Um, so this is just to give you some sense. Um, it's a fast-moving trial. We're recruiting 800 people in 27 months. No, faster than that. Fast. Um, <laughs> it's a lot. It's a big study. Um, we recruit every single day, and because folks are in and out so fast, what we do is we have research assistants go in the morning if we have counselors scheduled to be at the jail that night. And just to give you some sense of this, we have 423 people randomized so far. Um, the inclusion criteria are that they don't expect to be sentenced. They're at least 18. Um, they're able to provide consent. And they have either had thought of the suicide method and had some intent to act on it in the last 30 days, or they've made a suicide attempt in the last 30 days. So these are folks at really high risk for suicide, and we've pretty easily come up with 423 of them um, out of two jails in, um, in about 15 months, and, but I'm sure there are many more. You know, just, it's limited by our RA's ability to get to them. So, you know, on average, they're young, um, a lot of minority representation, 4% uh, are veterans. We got everything from this is our first incarceration, so they've been there a lot of times. Um, but what I wanted to show you down here in the red circle is, you know, about half have had an attempt in the past 30 days. Uh, 80%, 82% have had an attempt in their life. 91% um, have had suicide behavior in their lifetime. So that includes, it's a Columbia-defined suicide behavior, which is um, an attempt, an interrupted attempt, an attempt that they start and then change their mind or some preparation. So buying a gun, getting pills, writing notes, that kind of thing. So 91% have done that. 65% have had inpatient psychiatric hospitalization, 42% have had lifetime psychosis, 36% lifetime um, bipolar, and 82% lifetime major depression. So, you know, um, I guess this probably isn't a surprise to a lot of you, but I mean, this is a population at really high risk, and it's interesting because we have two of the leading suicide researchers in the country on this study with us, and they're constantly commenting about that this is the riskiest population they've ever seen more than emergency departments, more than inpatient units, more than anything um, that these folks are at risk. Um, and, you know, and the other thing that strikes me as a clinician is that it's really interesting. A lot of the attempts that we see are mostly impulsive. 
the Columbia goes through and asks five questions. Have you had a wish to be dead? Have you thought about how to kill yourself? Have you thought about how to do it to a method? Have you had any intent to act on it? And have you made a plan, which is like a specific date, time, really thought it through? And almost none of our attempters actually make plans. They just act. Uh, you know, right? Because this is an impulsive set of folks. Um, the methods are often guns, often overdose, often um, provoking someone into a gunfight, whether police or other people on the street. Um, they're pretty uh, violent, I guess. Um, so again, it just speaks to the high-risk nature of the group that if they set out to kill themselves, they use pretty lethal methods. Um, so this is the first randomized trial of any intervention for suicide risk reduction following release from jail. Um, there was good recognition of suicides at first admission to jail, and the justice system has done a lot of things to try to reduce those. Not so much randomized trials, right, because that's what researchers do. Um, but it was really interesting when we went to go publish this trial. I think it's the first randomized trial maybe of any suicide prevention in jail or after. It's definitely the first for after jail or prison. And, you know, the three leading causes of death in the year after incarceration are um, – suicide, homicide, and overdose. Not necessarily in that order, they switch around, but a lot of folks die. Um, and just briefly what the intervention is, like I said, it's evidence-based in emergency departments. We take community mental health counselors, um, have them come into the jail, do a safety plan with the person in jail. The safety plan is very structured. Um, it starts with what could you do to distract yourself if you're feeling suicidal? What are things that you like to do that could get your mind off of it? Um, what are um, people that you could talk to or places you could go and not talk about suicide, you know, just to sort of, like I said, get your mind off of it. Um, then people you could tell that you're feeling suicidal, then professional services that we can link you to, and then restriction of lethal means, so access to guns, access to cars, giving all the drugs to somebody else. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting. It's not and, and then the counselors call them four to eight times during the six months after release to the community to try to help link them to services. And I would make the case about this intervention, it's adjunctive, it's not mental health treatment. But what it does, because most suicides are impulsive and it's a lot like drug use, if you can get somebody through the moment and act, you've kept them safe for the moment until they can do the next thing. And people will say, you know, with bridges or whatnot, that if you put up nets, People just go to another bridge and jump. And the truth is, like, a few determined folks will do that. But most people, it's an in-the-moment kind of thing. So the purpose is to keep them safe in the moment and then hook them to mental health treatment services. Um, so like I said, uh, the purpose is to reduce suicide in the community. And it was really interesting. When I was doing press on the study, people kept talking about the jail. And I kept trying to make the point, no, the jail intersects with the community. We're using this as a way to identify folks at risk and prevent suicide in the community. Um, and, and I, again, that speaks to the sort of disconnect in people's minds between jail health and community health, um, which is detainee health is public health. So, you know, everybody was excited. This was a, um, an effort between National Institute of Mental Health, National Institute of Justice, um, important public health issue. Actually, it was the first big grant into Flint. It's an almost $7 million trial. So everybody was excited and doing all this press on this trial. But the press, you know, it's interesting because when you read down in the comments, which you should never do if you're ever in the news, but I did because, I don't know, I just wanted to know. But the comments sort of speak to the larger issue behind addressing some of these problems, these health problems in the justice system. Let me give you an example. A total waste of money. Waste was actually misspelled. I fixed it. Um, <laughs> not to be snarky. Take the money and put it toward preventing all the suicides by veterans. I don't care about prisoners, I care about veterans' priorities. Okay, so first of all, you saw like some percent of them are veterans. It's not a big percent, but some of them are. Secondly, they're not prisoners, they're in jail, but whatever. Um, <laughs> productive members of society pay to spend millions to study the drugs of society, what a country. Okay, so first of all, they're not prisoners. Secondly, they're innocent until proven guilty. Thirdly, and this is the one I think where, you know, there's evidence that shows that sentencing even though people will say that it has to do with rehabilitation or punishment or deterrence, that sentencing actually is most highly correlated with jurors or judges' emotional reaction to the crime. It's not as rational as people like to say it is. And it's really interesting because 
I think you run up against a lot of these sort of gut level reactions when you're trying to do work in the system. And the first one is that somehow providing adequate population health care means you're condoning crime, right? Um, and and it's you know, I don't know, I might have thought that before I did work in the system. It's like, well, why, you know, why should we reward them for, I don't know what. But, but I, you know, I think it's part of the public media messaging that needs to happen around this is that providing health care doesn't mean that you're condoning crime. Crime is bad. We don't want crime. Health is good. We do want health. And these two things can coexist, right? Um, and it's a philosophical problem with providing health care to people seen as lesser, undeserving, and these perspectives directly affect public health. And it's really interesting. I don't know. A lot of you do this work, right? So uh, I've been at places where I was working with, you know, professionals who, you know, did mental health treatment work with me all day long. And as soon as you say you do work in the jail or prison, you can kind of see the wall go up like that has nothing to do with me, right? We distance ourselves because think about it. And so, I, you know, part of our work is reducing that psychological distance um, between people and the justice system and um, helping them understand, like I said, that this, this is part of public health and population health. Okay, so let me tell you about how I started briefly. Um, I started doing work in the system with a K award back in the day in 2006. I actually started a little bit before that. Um, and my mentor at the time was Karen Botnick at Brown University. I love her. And she said, you should go out and talk to the women in prison you without them. And I thought, eh. You know, I don't know, that doesn't sound so fun. I'd done a little bit of work in graduate school out in a prison in a mental health unit, maximum security. I couldn't talk to anyone without a radio and people chained to the floor. And I just, it didn't, I don't know, I didn't enjoy it too much. But I went into this women's prison and at the time I was 30 and I had a couple of kids. And I um, remember thinking, oh my goodness, this could have been me, right? Because you see women all in their 20s and 30s and most of them have a couple of kids. Um, and what I loved about doing work there, how many of you have ever like done clinical work of any kind, medical, anything with folks in jail or prison? Raise your hand. All right, a few. Okay, so what I loved about it was that they tell it like it is. They're pretty disinhibited. You'll laugh, you'll cry, but you'll never be bored. And um, just treating people um, with respect, they're so grateful because they don't often get it. We were having a meeting of my uh, spirit suicide prevention group, yes, Wednesday, and one of the new research assistants said, you know, how do you do this work every day and not be sad? Because we hear about such sad things, folks are suicidal, you know, what do we do? And how do you not take it home with you at the end of the day? And it's really interesting, my project coordinator, who's a social worker, said, you know, think about what you are offering, and sometimes just being someone who gives a bleep is more than they'll get all day long. So, you know, just giving a darn um, matters. So you can do small things and feel like you're making a big difference. So anyway, so I was hooked. So I went back and I did a small randomized trial of an adapted um, intervention called interpersonal psychotherapy, uh, which I will tell you about in a minute, for co-occurring uh, depression and substance use for women nearing prison release. And these women were all in residential treatment in the prison for substance use you know, most women with substance use disorder in prisons and jails have co-occurring mental health problems, and the, the vast majority. And the rationale was if you're depressed by definition, you're uh, not as functionally able to take care of yourself, especially things that prison release. So, you know, we try to help treat the depression. So um, let me tell you a little bit about IPT because it's going to come up again. Uh, this is a, it's one of the two top evidence-based mental health treatments for depression in the literature in general. The other one's cognitive behavioral therapy. For some reason, IPT has done less of a good job marketing itself, I think, but it's actually, in one of the biggest trials to date, was found to even be better than CBT for really severe depression. Um, and I like it for this population because it's intuitive. What, what I do as a clinician is I'll go in, um, establish the time that the current depressive episode started, and then ask the person what was going on in your life or at that time. And I'm listening for four things. I'm listening for death of somebody close to them, a life change, could be divorce, retirement, losing your kids, getting arrested, um, relationship status change, anything, conflict with important other people in your life, or just social isolation. And as you can guess, for people in prison, um, usually it was not difficult to find one, if not many of these things. 
um, they're more, many more likely than other people to have lost somebody um, through violent or unexpected death. Um, you know, I got a lot of, um, my kids are with my mom who has really bad health conditions. I'm worried about her or who abused me. And so I'm worried about them, but I don't have anyone else to send them to, but she and I are fighting, but I still think it's better for the kids than going to foster care. You know, it's just all of these stories. Um, and these are really the things that the women, and I'll tell you about in a few minutes, the men worry about at night. You know, will my partner be there for me when I get out? Are they being faithful? Um, will I get my kids back? Will I, you know, it, these, are the, these are the things that folks worry about at night. So I think that it's, um, it's a really good treatment. And a lot of the jail and prison treatments, I think appropriately, are very behavioral. They're focused on behavior. And I think that's important. But I think that that some of the programs tend to neglect a little bit these sort of larger, I would call them emotional and relational issues. So this was group treatment in prison and six weekly individual sessions in the community after release. And this first study used trained mental health providers, which I'll get to in a minute. So again, to show you these samples, you know, it goes through a lot of these samples are a lot more severe than you would see in most mental health treatment trials. You know, that all, you saw those with suicide stats, right? worse than most emergency department trials. Well, this is worse than any depression trial I've ever seen. Um, the mean intake, this is the HRSD Hamilton score was 28. The median number, which is really, really high. The median number of past depressive episodes was 10 or more. And that was despite the fact that 64% were taking antidepressant medications and they were still meeting criteria for major depression. So you got severe recurrent treatment resistant depression. Um, but, you know, um, IPT actually resulted in lower post-treatment depressive symptoms than the control condition did. And there was a trend toward lower post-release substance use, but that was underpowered. So let me show you this. So this is a nice slide. You can see there, um, here, this is IPT before and after, psychoed before and after. What's interesting here is this level of depression. I mean, they were much, much, much better. M many were still not cured. This is an average level of depression you might see at intake of a community trial. Um, but still, I mean, that's, it's a lot better than it was. So, you know, IPT was feasible and acceptable in a women's prison, all this touchy-feely, you know, relationship stuff. Um, and it resulted in significant decreases in depressive symptoms. However, and many of you will know this, but this was news to me. You know, I thought when I went into the trial, oh, fantastic, we'll give them six weekly sessions in the community after their release, that'll help them get connected to other services, it'll be great. Um, but the truth is, you know, it's hard to connect with people after release. How many of you have tried to, like, do treatment or any kind of services with folks in the few weeks after release? Okay, a few people. All right, so the way this works, though, is that, you know, when we, we it often took, we often, you know, didn't really connect with them again until two weeks after. 70% of the women that were going to relapse to drugs and alcohol had already done it by then. And it's really that first 24 to 72 hours. Um, they're tough. People go out, a lot of people go out with the best of intentions, but, you know, boyfriend who says that he's clean and sober and has a safe place to live is really living in his car and selling drugs out of the car, right? Or, um, no, really. Or, you know, you go to a residential treatment facility, you're kind of stressed out because you just got out, um, you get into an argument with the treatment facility person, storm out into the night and get sexually assaulted. And then you're back to using drugs. I mean, this was not uncommon. Or, you know, the main bus route in Rhode Island goes, the bus interchange is the drug market. Some women never made it home. So, so it's really tough. And, you know, I underestimated that. So this next series was like, what of studies was like, what do we do about the 24 to 72 hours right after release? You know, how do we keep people from just falling off the radar that fast? Um, so I, I went back and I did a lot of qualitative studies with participants and system providers to better understand the processes of mental health and substance use relapse at reentry. And, you know, it's sad because the, a lot of the, um, Inmates blame the providers, but the providers know that they aren't providing adequate services, but they just don't have the resources to do it, right? They're really, they, there's just not enough resources. So, you know, this says, my problem in mental health is I don't have enough resources to provide them counseling and psychoeducation in addition to medication management. I could use a lot more. Oftentimes, we're just treating crises. We've gotten away from that. 
somewhat, but now I'm having staffing problems, so we're back to more crisis management. You're in for domestic assault, this is for women, and your biggest need is to learn how to manage your anger, and the only thing I can offer you is why don't you see the social worker once a month and work on that. Okay, well, I'm here for three months. Okay, so you'll see the social worker three times. It's better than nothing, but how is that going to impact her at all? It's not. Um, and this, we don't have enough resources. I mean, it's so hard. It's just, and it's a fault of, it's a societal issue. Prisons are being asked to do stuff that they're not really set up to do. So here you can see the sort of provider's angst or that, that happens between being given a public health charge and not the resources to really carry it out, right? Um, and then when you go to the community, you know, they say this, and so this sort of speaks to that gap between the prison and the community. And it's really interesting because what we effectively do by trying to, you know, hook them up with community care is we actually create a gap in care right at the moment when they need help the most, you know, right around the three entry period. So, so as in prison, they have all the support right at their fingertips. The mental health worker on the wing is right down the hall. Then when they leave, it's like nothing. What do you mean I got to call and make an appointment? What do you mean I got to wait three weeks? No, I don't have insurance. Yeah. Then what are they doing in that three weeks? Do you really think that they're sitting quietly and reading books? And so someone like this didn't show up okay, and then they call back and they have to wait, or they owe $30 and they can't come back. So then this person is struggling, teetering on going back to drugs, and they're screwed because they can't get their mental health appointment and they have to go through hoops. So, you know, this, this sort of speaks to some of these issues because a lot of the, um, a lot of, the providers in the community who inter intersect with this population are also publicly funded, right? And so they don't really have a lot of resources either. So you get this resource shortage on both sides. So this sort of speaks to this larger implementation com um, context, which makes this hard, right? So the dilemma about providing treatment to offenders is that customers are people who have wronged society and are being punished. So they're considered lesser citizens and they may affect the empathy of general society and the attitudes of treatment agencies toward offenders and the external community may debate whether treatment services for offenders are essential or the responsibility of taxpayers. And a Faye Taxman, who I work with, you know, she found that agency leaders are unsure how to address the perception that if they're, they're being soft on offenders, if behavioral health care is valued or evidence-based practices are followed. So it also almost becomes this values issue of do folks deserve treatment and does society, do they deserve for what is mostly publicly funded treatment, right? So it's this health versus justice or health and justice issue. So, you know, the public indirectly controls how many people are in the justice system, resources available to treat them, and which treatments are acceptable. So Faye tells a great story, which I love, about an agency that had money to do contingency management, which how many of you know what that is? Okay, so it was a, it was a, probation parole agency, they had money to provide contingency management, which is a very strongly evidence-based substance use practice. And the rationale is this, is that you pay people for clean urine. And what that does is it interrupts the use long enough that the treatment can actually take effect. You know, other treatments, you can get them other services and kind of stabilize them. And it's actually been found to be cost-effective relative to treatment. It's actually cheaper to give someone $20 for clean urine than it is to pay $60 for an hour of a therapist's time. And so what it'll do is it'll interrupt this problematic behavior long enough that you can kind of do some other things for them. So they got a call from a state legislator that said that rewarding those people was preposterous, and if the agency pursued the, um, this, this program even using private money, that they would pull all the state money from the agency. So they didn't, right? So, so again, you know, we're prone in medicine, people are not rational, and we're prone in public policy to making decisions not based on data. And yet this is a circumstance in which in the justice system, you know, all the medical evidence and all the randomized trials and whatever, it's, they don't, the fact that the public and legislators have a lot of feelings about what should or shouldn't happen, especially sometimes interferes with data-driven decision-making. Um, so what you have to do to get these things, people on board is you have to actually convince sometimes elected officials and the people who elect them that the evidence-based practice is worthwhile, right? And it's hard because if you ever see a commercial during um, election season, if it's anything about the justice system, it's I'm so-and-so and I put criminals behind bars. That's what you can do in 15 seconds. This is enough of a nuanced argument that it's hard to make over the longer term, but unless, like I said, it becomes in our job as behavioral health treatment providers or whatever to, to sell or help folks understand that this is part of addressing health problems in society in general um, and to circumvent the knee-jerk reaction. 
So, you know, policy targets, I know you guys do a lot of policy work, you know, help policymakers and voters understand that the justice system is one of the U.S.'s largest public health systems and to fund and staff it accordingly, or just, and, or, just reduce incarceration rates so that individuals can be treated in community mental health systems, community health systems, right? I would take both of those. And then shore up the publicly funded mental health and substance use treatment systems so that fewer people fall through the cracks, become manic or psychotic, and get picked up by police, and insurance coverage, access to care in the community, and smoothing the care linkages between down the community become really important. Um, so how, whoa. Hold on a second. Okay, so there's a few different ways, and these are studies I'll tell you about quickly, and then a couple studies in more depth. So there is actually a, uh, the Michigan Mental Health and Justice Center, which I propose, which I will tell you about in a little bit, of which Vera and the Council of State Government and the New York City Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice are all consortium partners, is getting reviewed today at NAMH. And one of, the pro one of the projects in that, I partnered with a communication scholar to look at how to use public media messages to shift public attitudes toward um, evidence-based behavior behavioral health services for justice-involved folks. And sort of like, can, uh, is it possible to use communication tactics to, to help inform the public to the point that we can get evidence-based things into the justice system? So I'm excited about that because the more I started out as a treatment researcher, but the more I do this, I really think the problems are policy problems. Um, so that's exciting. Um, I'll tell you about another study that targeted influence policy in a minute. I don't do any big study now without my health economist. I put cost effectiveness into everything because it's not enough to show it improves health. A lot of times to change policy, you have to show it reduces cost. Um, so I'm wise to that now. And I study low cost or free interventions to the extent that I can. Um, let me give you just a little postscript to that first study with the women releasing and all the things that happened to them. I went back to them and did focus groups and said, hey, what would help you guys after release? And one of the things they said, you know, is that we know our providers, we know our counselors in prison, but then we're expected to go to all these other counselors. So one of the things, I think it was their idea, and they named the phones sober phones. We gave them cheap phones. They weren't smartphones. They were just little potato phones and put in the numbers of their prison counselors, all, you know, sober treatment services, um, you know, sober network members or whatever, and gave them the phones that released and then tried the same intervention again, except had the counselors call them every single day for the first, I think it was months, and then taper off over three months. And it was really interesting because, um, to give you an example, one of the women went back to a guy who she knew was abusive, but she felt bad because he was dying of kidney failure. You know, she loved him, and so she went back. Um, he began abusing her again, was using her as a drug mule to run back and forth between Rhode Island and New York. Um, he, her, he, I'm trying to think of how much I can say about this. He threatened to kill her in front of younger family members, took her shoes, took her phone, and held her hostage. And the phone was our phone. So she um, was in the house for a couple of days. She managed to escape. She crawled out like underneath something so he didn't see her. And she went and she was in a, so it was, I think, March. It was cold. It was in the Northeast. She was hiding in somebody's car. They called the police. The police came. She said she was in a domestic violence situation. For some reason, they did not take her to a shelter or do anything about it. They just told her she had to keep going. So after three days of this, she was trying to find a particular friend. But, you know, one of the things that abusive people do is that they try to isolate the woman or, who, you know, the abuse. So there's the boyfriend had been calling all her friends and trying to figure out where she was and, and um, yeah. So when she found her friend, the friend was actually on the phone with the boyfriend because he'd been calling. And so she decided that if her friend was, you know, in cahoots with the boyfriend, which she kind of wasn't, wasn't, she was just going to go back because there was no point. So our counselor reaches her, calls her. She tells our counselor this whole long story. And the counselor says, well, are you in mental health treatment in the community? She said, yeah. But have you told your counselor this? No. Why? Because I don't know her. I mean, how do you walk into a first or second appointment and tell them that whole story? Right? That's really tough. So it, it is a challenge to do this continuity of care. You know, another woman um, went through, uh, she, she had to come back to do probation for a probation and parole visit, actually forgot the address of the agency where she was. 
and walked six miles back in the winter without a coat and was crying, called the counselor but managed to make it back um, to the um, facility. And you know, is this a panacea? No, it wasn't. The women kept losing the phones. Um, the woman I told you about made it through that day, but relapsed a few weeks later. But I do think it was a step in the right direction and just anything to sort of bridge the continuity with somebody familiar during that vulnerable time is important. Okay, so um, when I went published that first little trial of 38 women, I realized when I went to publish it, it was the largest randomized trial for major depression among any incarcerated population, despite the fact that 150 per year are published for non-incarcerated populations. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's, I, just, I couldn't believe it. So it demonstrates the need for more research, especially for justice folks around mental health, especially that collect actual mental health outcomes and not just justice outcomes. Um, so I did a large trial, 181 prisoners, I don't know what just happened to my PowerPoint, um, with depression in nine facilities across two states. This was all just in prison. I wanted to see if this could be implemented in prison. Um, they were randomized to group IPT or prison mental health treatment as usual. I tried to make the um, intervention as inexpensive as I could, like to make it a community dose, but on the cheap. So one of the things I realized in that first trial was that I was the only PhD level provider in that whole system, the whole state justice system, except for the head of mental health services. And that most of the folks, if people got seen by anyone, they were bachelor's level sort of substance use counselors without necessarily mental health training. So I'd done work to show that I could train bachelor's level counselors without mental health training to do this IPT because it's actually, it's not complicated and not worked. So in this study, um, this particular study, I used these bachelor's level counselors and then master's level social workers um, and had small groups two times a week, which is, like I said, sort of what would be on the cheap for the community, but it would be a lot more frequent than prison mental health treatment as usual. Um, and we chose outcomes to be persuasive to prison decision makers. Um, we're in the process of writing this paper, so it hasn't been published yet, but the general outcomes are um, we recruit significantly uh, reduce depressive symptoms at post-treatment. Um, we significantly reduce hopelessness, actually a lot. Um, and among those with suicide ideation in six months prior to baseline, the median percent weeks with suicide ideation during the follow-up period was 3% for IPT and 53% for treatment as usual. Because of the way the sample was, that didn't end up being significant, but it was in the right direction. I was hoping to show that this, because, you know, just sell it to prison providers. Again, it has to be more than just the health outcomes that it would show differences in number of correctional programs completed, disciplinary reports, aggression or victimization. It doesn't look like those outcomes panned out. So I still have to follow up and see, and I haven't done the cost effectiveness analyses yet. So I would say that this is mixed results. On the one hand, it was effective for depression and hopelessness, which was great. And on the other hand, I'm not sure we got action on some of the other, what I would call them prison hassle outcomes that I think we might need to sell it. However, I'm excited we just got asked to train um, the entire federal prison system in Ontario, Canada, in IPT. So I think that's good. I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, so these are implementation outcomes, what it had to do with implementation. So we were able to train the bachelor's level providers who had good outcomes. However, it was hard. I mean, just to start with, this is mental health treatment. It's tough. So I'm on the fence about whether or not I think that's the way to go most of the time. But we were able to do it. It was just a lot of work. And when counselors had run at least one previous group, the effects were larger. But the fidelity, you know, when we trained the bachelor's level counselors, it was a lot of work, they did well. Um, and we went and we did surveys um, and interviews with a lot of the providers, you know, to look at what would it take to get this tr treatment implemented in the system. And the survey results indicated that providers and administrators viewed depression as an important problem. They saw current strategies for treating it within prisons as inadequate. They tended to be oriented toward rehabilitation rather than punishment. They were friendly toward evidence-based practices, and they viewed IPT as appropriate and acceptable. So they were actually motivated. They're one of the most motivated groups of providers to implement an evidence-based practice that I've seen because I think that they know the system's broken, right? They know it. And so they're, they're desperate and eager for anything that they think might help. Um, and that's not always the case when you go into community agencies. Sometimes they just don't want to do anything new or they don't want to be bothered. Well, these folks were willing to be bothered. They wanted, they wanted to do something different. There was also a very motivated and desperate, you could argue, patient population. 
The most readily available depression treatment in prisons is antidepressants. Often, sometimes those aren't given at all. Sometimes people get no treatment, but um, sometimes, you know, if they get anything, it's antidepressants, but many prisoners want alternatives because they're still depressed even though they're on antidepressants. You know, they're having people in their lives die, arguments with important family members. They want to be able to talk about that. And in one of the states where I was working, there was somebody who was paroled who had an anxiety disorder, which you guys know, like it's whatever. He had an anxiety disorder and got out and killed somebody. So that state decided for a while not to parole anybody on the mental health caseload or getting mental health treatment, even though an anxiety disorder could have nothing to do with somebody killing. It just, the response isn't rational. So a lot of times folks don't want to be labeled or be taking medication. Um, but the barriers were that there's more need than there is money in all the mental health contracts to meet it. The allocation set by the state legislator, therefore, sometimes those directly involved don't have control and limited resource translates into heavy caseloads and, you know, just sometimes just inadequate supervision, um, which led to problems among the mental health staff. So, again, it gets back to this need versus resources issue. Um, so, like I said, prison providers are motivated and friendly toward innovation, but the public investment in offender health is low and resource and system barriers are substantial. Um, so, it gets back to we don't have enough resources. Prisons are being asked to do stuff they're not really set up to do. So, what can we do about this? Well, you guys are doing a lot of things about it. I'll say a couple quick things and then we'll stop so we can discuss. Um, I now design every study I have so that if the outcomes would have policy implications. So, there's a finding in the poverty literature in behavioral economics that conditions of extreme scarcity like subsistence farming in India or even extreme poverty in the United States temporarily reduce fluid intelligence and ability to make decisions by a standard deviation. And it's not nutrition and it's not stress. It's the mechanism that it seems to work by is just the attention that gets divided between having to make impossible trade-offs. So, you know, do I um, sleep somewhere safe tonight or get something to eat? Or do I, you know, send my daughter to school or do I, you know, do something for my son? Or do I go work but leave my kids alone? I mean, it's just sort of just constantly having to weigh things that people shouldn't have to decide between. And when folks are in those conditions, um, they become more impulsive and less able to think through problems by a lot. And then as soon as the conditions change, they're back to where they were. So as soon as I heard this, it, it hadn't really been tested in health outcomes. I thought about prison reentry, right? Because how many people have you seen who really mean to do well, but but they get out in the world and they just fall apart and, and the conditions are hard, they really are, but I thought, you know, what if what we're doing by putting people in the conditions they're in actually not only makes the situation hard, but makes them less able to think things through clearly. Because th I've seen people who make decisions on the outside I don't think they would have made two weeks before. So this was another qualitative quote, which is just reminded me of, you know, as soon as they hit the community, this is the women, everybody, the men went from the family, the kids, everyone's pulling at them, pulling at them. Clinicians make these great plans, but unless you have someone walking with this individual to get these things done, to keep this person in focus, it's not going to happen because they're not strong enough to do all these different things. So this is a little study to see um, whether some of these characteristics of reentering prisoners that affect health behaviors that people thought were just sort of static characteristics of people are actually influenced by contextual factors and therefore are open to policy interventions like wraparound services, for example. I mean, the implication would be this is partially our fault, right, if this is true. So I, I like that study. I'm analyzing the data now. I think it'll be interesting to see. Um, so this, the other thing I'm really excited about um, is this Michigan Mental Health and Justice Center. It is getting reviewed today. Um, and the goal is to, at, at the National Institute of Mental Health, the goal is to accelerate the pace of transdisciplinary research to solve these systemic barriers um, for mental health care for justice-involved individuals. Um, I'm calling out my wonderful New York partners. And some of the, the uh, barriers we're taking on are IT and big data challenges to continuity of care. So in a lot of counties, there's no way to electronically link the jail to community mental health. So this is a simple way that it's a program that sits on the community mental health side, um, searches jail records, admissions, discharges, and court dockets every day that notifies the clinicians if anyone on their caseload has any of these things so they can reach out to the jail, remind the person to go to court so they don't get a failure to appear, you know, that kind of thing. 
Um, the second study is this one that's going to use um, media messaging to see if we can get movement on adopting evidence-based practices. And then the third addresses uh, racial disparities. But the center will also put out calls for small pilot projects every year. And the part I think is most exciting is it will serve a think tank function of bringing together a bunch of academic partners and a bunch of consortium partners at local, state, and national levels who are mental health treatment providers, substance use treatment providers, justice agencies, coalitions of justice agencies to think about how to address these issues. So I think I had a lot of other thoughts, but I am going to get to a slide. Oh, here's my team. Here's the spirit study team. Here's the team for the other studies. And I'm going to stop there and take questions. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It'd be nice if this was available everywhere. Um, what was? Uh, oh, what you uh, mentioned here. It'd be nice if this, this treatment was available everywhere because it's unavailable at the Manhattan Center, which they called Tunes, which where I was incarcerated mm -hmm. years ago on the Morgan Fall, Jose Freddy Cougar. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's definitely not. Is that the unavailable by Killer Island, a.k.a. Rikers Island? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so that's the challenge, right? So <clears throat> on the one hand, so studies to show that something works are effectiveness studies. Studies about how to get it to happen in the real world are implementation studies. And that's the challenge, and that's what a lot of things we're talking about is, you know, in some cases we know what works in a lot of cases, but to make it happen is the challenge. And so then, you know, a lot of us do work about how do you make what you know needs to happen happen. Go ahead. Yeah, on a, on a th thanks firstly for a really interesting presentation. On a, on a similar kind of vein, I guess, um, there are, whenever working in corrections, I think there are workforce issues um, mm -hmm. to do with medical providers who work in corrections, their skills and training, their orientation. Um, and so I just wondered if you have thoughts about that generally, and then you're thinking about interventions which are being provided by your team, piloted in your team, or, or just how, um, is there, um, what do you think about models where you have people coming into jails and prisons to provide services versus equipping staff who are there versus some other kind of hybrid model? So all of these studies except the first one used providers that were there. Um, or, you know, in the case where we were doing an in-reach model, that's, that's why I was using bachelor's level providers, right? The providers that were available were bachelor's level providers making $13 an hour. That's who was available. And I thought, if I can't do that with this treatment with them, it will never happen. So that was the whole point of that second study is that we can actually do it. It's work, but we can do it. Um, the one, the SPIRIT study um, brings in the community mental health providers, which is what, how it would be, happen in the real world. It's an in-reach. Um, so, yeah, if you can't do it with the providers that are there, you might as well not bother. So, you know, you get to these, trying to um, simplify the interventions as much as possible and then show that you can train. I, I, guess, I guess that's a way to say yes, exactly. All right. We're here. Thank you so much. Um, I was curious, looking into 2018 with all the gubernatorial and congressional elections that are coming up, what one policy or set of policies would you hope that they might advocate as they're running, and then obviously if they were to win, to implement? So I, ha I have two. I know you said one. And I actually took this to Michigan and told them that I thought that this should be their um, priority. but. Um, you know, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, reducing incarcerated populations makes sense, right? From one angle, it makes sense because for cost reasons, from another angle, it makes sense for humanitarian reasons or whatever reasons. Um, but it doesn't make any sense. There's just no logical reason to incarcerate as many people as we do. In Rhode Island, it costs as much to incarcerate a woman as it does to give her a full ride to Brown for a year. IV, right, $50,000, $60,000. So there's just there's no reason for it, and a lot of folks are there for mental health and substance use reasons. And the case I made to Michigan was that it's really interesting coming from uh, Rhode Island and Mass that the sentencing is so different. You know, something a drug charge that might, women might serve three to six months for in Rhode Island, they can serve three to eight years for in Michigan. And when you think about eight years, when you go and your kids are six, they come out they're 14. And so the sentencing just doesn't need to be like it is. We have too many people incarcerated. It just there's, no, there's nothing good comes from that. 
So, and that would, that, but then that kicks everybody back to the community, right? Especially a lot of the folks with mental illness, which a lot of the frequent flyers in and out of jails are severely mentally ill. So the other thing that needs to happen is um, a, in multiple state community mental health systems have, they've really been suffering from a funding perspective. Um, and, but those systems really need to have the resources that they need to adequately treat people in the community. So I would say get them out of the justice system, all except the ones that really need to be there for whatever reason, decide what that means, um, and then provide adequate services to, to community mental health so that they can be maintained successfully in the community. And you'd save money, I think. Thank you, great presentation um, and excellent work that you do. I was wondering if you looked at the location of the suicides, where they might have happened in the jail environment, and if there was a correlation with with isolation. The so ocean. these are none of these are suicides in the jail. It's all um, in, the, all community. in the community. We're not. We're we're not. It, it doesn't address suicide in the jail. We use the jail as a way to identify who the folks at risk are. We make a plan in the jail for release, but it's all about that post release period. Oh, and I was going to tell you guys this. I forgot. So we've had maybe 300 or so released. Um, we've had a lot of suicide attempts. I mean, in the sample of large, so some of this is a control group, but we've actually had eight people die so far. And five were overdoses, two were homicides, actually, people who were shot, and one was a domestic violence-related suicide. And um, for me, it goes to show, and we're not even through the full year follow-up yet, so I think we're looking at probably what's going to be a 3% or so mortality rate in a population that's mostly in their 20s and 30s. So it's just, it's just it's just high risk, which which gets back to your point. You know, I don't since a pilot thing I did as a postdoc, I use providers that are there, volunteers like AA volunteers, um, community mental health. I use the people in the system to try to do it, and if you can't do that, you can't do it. Yes. Hi. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. It was really interesting and informative. I'm wondering, um, just taking a little bit different approach, mm -hmm. if there's anything that we know looking cross-nationally about what works really well in terms of effectiveness or implementation, any lessons that we can bring back here to the U.S.? Well, I mean, I'll tell you my answer is, yeah, don't incarcerate so many people. I mean, right? I mean, there's models where, where um, I, I think of developed countries have one of the highest crime rates and also the highest incarceration rate. And so there's the correlation between those two things. I, I don't think there's good international data if you really look at it that says that incarcerating more people reduces crime. But policy isn't, a, I have to be a little careful. I was gonna say policy isn't amenable to logic, right? It's not, um, people are not being logical about this. So I think there are really good international models, but it's the question is how do you spell them in the US? And so that's where I rely on my communication expert about you know, or, or political um, communication experts, because it's it, it, well, we got to get people out of the knee-jerk reaction and actually thinking about it. Because I think, you know, if you look at the data, it's pretty clear, but it's just such a fast knee-jerk, and then people don't think about it more than that. Did they answer your question? I mean, how do you think we should do it? Well, I mean, on the one hand, you're saying that the U.S. is unique, you know, and it's the other. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that the U.S. is unique, and mm -hmm. and you know these other. You know, what we know from Australia or other mm -hmm. places may not apply. Um, I don't know. I mean, it brings up the question, and I, I was really interested to see that you have a messaging component mm -hmm. there, too. And I mean, I, I guess so I would ask you, and how, I, or you're going to find out how to message to, mm -hmm. um, to stakeholders who are very invested mm -hmm. in keeping the system going as well, you know, yeah. so that's an interesting thing. Yeah, and I think, you know, for a lot of lawmakers, I don't think people are sitting out there trying to make other people's lives harder. I really don't, right? Um, and I think for a lot of lawmakers, reduced cost, you know, makes a lot of sense. And this argument about folks to be better treated in the community makes a lot of sense. Um, the, the part we have is stakeholders actually on the Justice Center. Um, I hope it gets fun, and I hope I have a chance to talk with them more because I'm less sure how to have a conversation with, like, correctional officer unions. Um, who, whose livelihood depends on the number of people incarcerated. Although when I talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, nobody seems to really be super invested in incarcerating a lot of people. But I, So I'm interested in a conversation with them, I guess. And I'm not saying, I, I do think other countries do this better, but it's, 
it's almost like a fundamental philosophical difference that that I am still trying to figure out how to address in the U.S. And if anyone has any ideas, let me know. Those of you who are policy active, could probably take one more question. Oh, and and let me just say one more thing. I don't think. I think the U.S. is unique in what it's doing. I do think things that work in other countries would work here, but it's just how to get people to try it is the challenge. I have another question. Uh, we have many people in hospitals, but I thought we started with the So we talked a lot about the issues with providers in within the prison system, so like mm -hmm. correctional health providers. And it sounds like a lot of your work is also about linking that to community health. So what recommendations do you have for enhancing, you know, community mental health centers responses to people who have justice involvement? Yeah, so, um, and, and I have to say, all the providers I've worked with on both sides do everything they can do. They all know that the linkage doesn't work as well as it should, and they all try, and there are not enough of them. I mean, it becomes a funding issue, right? That's ultimately a person work issue. And if there aren't the people, it's hard to make the linkage. I do think some of these, you know, technological issues with um, uh, just alerting the community mental health providers that their client is justice involved and giving them some things they can do about it can help. Um, for a while, it was as bad as, because the systems are underfunded and they had paper records for a long time after everyone else had electronic medical records, just even knowing who was on, I mean, it, it was actually a paper search until a few years ago. It would take somebody all day to, and nobody had time for that. So I think that if there was funding for service linkage between the systems, it would happen more. There was in Genesee County for a while, somebody who worked for community mental health, sat in the jail and did the linkage, would actually make appointments, but then they lost the grant for that. And to give you some idea, you know, the county isn't worse off than a lot of other counties. The jail does a lot of really good things, and they're funded for one day a week of psychiatrists for 13,000 admissions a year, more than half of whom have mental health problems. So it's not, I mean, I think that they try to operate heroically with what they have, but there just aren't enough people. And I think with enough people, there are good models for what could be done. But then, you know, there's, you know, we can also think creatively about how to make tighter linkages without bodies. I don't know, without people to do it. I do think there's hope here. I do think there's a lot of things that can be done. Um, I, by talking about the problems, I hope to motivate you to go out and fight them and to address them and try to bring awareness to your friends and family and legislative representatives. So, and I do think, you know, there are things that we can show work and then it's just getting it to happen. So thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, and thank you to everyone. This is the final um, speaker series of the year. So we look forward to seeing you guys again in 2018. Thanks.